I wanted to, on Friday, I was going to talk about trees and I was going to go, well, Kedashim is about, well, you can, you, three words are normally associated with it. First word is uh, holy. Second word is sanctified. And the third word is separated. Um, contextually, the word separated is the closest to understanding what the word means. When it talks about the Jewish priests being uh, holy, it talks about them being separated. In other words, that they are, they are assigned a different lot. When we talk about separated, that doesn't mean we leave society and go off on our own. It, it means that we attempt to divul- diverse ourselves from immorality. That's, that's the basic context of the word. In um, the uh, text is 19, Leviticus 19, and it's uh, three verses. And uh, so anyway, so this is a precursor to what I was going to teach. So it's 23, verse 23, 24 and 25. Okay. Okay. Now, Joe, you're going to get mad at me because I'm going to probably use Jewish words and, and, and I'm going to follow that up with uh, the fact that there's some Kabbalah, mystical understandings. Besides the literal, you're going to have to listen to some of the other stuff. So if you want to plug your ears uh, about five minutes in, then you're going to have to start. Okay. But the three verses goes on to say, when you shall come to the land, and you shall plant any food tree or fruit tree, whichever you want to call it. You shall treat its fruit as forbidden. Now, the, the concept here is orla, and orla means uncircumcised. So, in other words, that technically the fruit itself is not uh, allowed to be eaten because it is uncircumcised. It's not kosher. But the word orla means means uncircumcised. Now, for three years, they shall be forbidden to you. They shall not be eaten. So the first three years that you've planted trees, and I went to Israel, to Mitzvah Yeriko, the trees they rode into the town was surrounded or was lined with olive trees. And uh, olive trees would eventually become part of their, their food. But at this point in time, it was within the first four years, actually. First three years, they were not allowed to even touch it. They were just simply allow it to go through its cycle. And then it goes on to say, in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be sanctified to laud Hashem. But in order to eat that fruit, you have to take it to to the temple or to the tabernacle. And since there is no temple or tabernacle today, They've identified another way of, of dealing with that whole concept. But that's what they're really talking about. So technically, you can't eat any of that fruit for the first three years you've planted it. And you really shouldn't be eating that fruit during the fourth year unless you've paid a ransom for it. So in other words, you're paying for food that you own, actually. And it's called a ransom. So therefore, you attach a value to whatever it is, how much it is. And you give that money to the poor or you give that money to whatever organization, but you, you pay for the food that's really on your own tree. Now it says in the fifth year, you may eat the fruit so that you will, uh, so that it will increase its crops for you. I am Hashem, your God. So the understanding was that in those, in that fifth year, that the tree now was to be producing its greatest amount of fruit. And it was now, yours to eat or do whatever you wish with it sell it whatever but it belonged to you at that particular point in time now this law if you're looking here says it was for the land but the uh, rabbis created a decree in which they said the trees in your yard wherever you live so if you live in new york city or you live in california or wherever you live those that same rule applies three years four years, fifth year, you may eat of the fruit on that tree. And that tree, by then, God has blessed it, and it will overproduce. That's the, that's the connotation that's given by the three scriptures. So 
the question then becomes, what's this about? Well, if you remember back to Genesis, the first, second, third chapters, second chapter especially, Adam and Eve were given a command. They could do anything they wanted in the garden, eat anything they wanted, except. Now, the concept was, that, or the oral understanding was, that if they would have waited three hours till after sunset, it would no longer have been the, the sixth day, it would have been the seventh day, and they would have been able to eat it as part of their of their of the holiness of the garden. So therefore, they came to the conclusion that for every hour, they would add a, a year to this understanding. So the idea was that it was now a three-year process. If they would have waited three years or three hours in this particular case. So this, there was an idea that there was a prohib, prohibition against fruit from the very beginning. And this was brought on by the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, in Rashi's explanation, he talks about the, the idea uh, of, well, let me read it. Rabbi Akiva used to say, the Torah says that because it has man's evil inclination in mind. In other words, we do tend to think outside the box, outside God's box. And therefore, it says that one should not say, behold, for four years, I must take trouble with, the, with, not for, with it for nothing. Therefore, the Torah states that, that because of your obedience, the land will give your produce larger quantities in the fifth year. So the idea then was, well, what does that mean? Why am, what am I waiting for? What, what's actually happening? If we understand that Kedoshim is about separation, then we're going to say the same thing about the fruit tree. The tree itself is just an example of what we're talking about. By that, I mean, in the first year, it's like a new soul. We live in a world of Asiya, the world of action. Guard our actions, what we do, how we do them. In the second year, would be called the year of Yetzirah which is Rob's book. Yetzirah speaks of formation. In this year, the formation of the fruit is something one should watch but not touch. The third year is the year called Beriah, which is the year of creation. By creation, we're now talking about the garden incident, going back to that idea. So you avoid that. And each and every year that you accomplish that what you've accomplished is raising your soul because you see our soul has five levels just as what we're going to talk about has five levels the first level is the level of nefesh that's the animal soul the second level is the level of ruach that's our our holy spirit if you will it's it's the ruach Adesh is what it's called the third level is the level called neshama that's the level where we now, hopefully, are all existing in. That's the level that we stand by. We are now following the Torah in a proper way. We have separated ourselves away from idolatry. We're no longer pledging flags and all of the other things that Joe's already talked about. And what we're doing now is preparing ourselves to get closer to God. Now, notice it says in the fourth year, you bring it to the temple. Well, the temple is, is in, our, in our being. Remember way back in Exodus, he says, I want you to build a house and I want you to build it here and I'll live in you. Not that he would live in the house, but he's going to live in you. So in other words, you've invited God to live in your world, within you. That level is now called Haya, which is the level of life. So now you have the life of God living within you. You're following the, the separation, the segregation that you've been doing, and now you're living with God in you. The next level is the impossible level. It's the level that you and I are going to reach when we, when we move into the world to come. That level is called Yechida. 
Yechida is the idea of the world to come. It's the world in which Solomon began to talk about it when he talked about a chicken in every pot and a, and a grape tree in every yard or a fruit tree in every yard. The idea of total satisfaction. Well, that total satisfaction comes when one becomes one with God. That's the fifth level of our soul. When we begin to move towards God, our soul begins to grow in that fashion also. We begin to develop those tendencies within us. That's the, that's the understanding that, that goes along with this idea. So in the five-year period, we go through what's called five universes, which is what Rob is going to read about in, in Zechariah or in Yetzirah. We're, we're going to grow into God. God sent us here on a suicide mission, mission, right? Everybody's here trying to understand what their purpose is in life and, and function. Well, in this suicide mission, we're constantly deciding what we're going to do, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. That's the, the point. As we go from the simplest thing, like fruit trees, the understanding is we grow through those. We grow through the understanding or the need for. And we find ourselves needing God more than the fruit tree. Remember Noah, after he got off of the ark, <clears throat> excuse me, Noah, after he got off the ark, the first thing he did was he planted an orchard. Or not an orchard, but a, a vineyard. He planted grape trees. Now, the question then became, why did he plant grape trees? Well, the Midrash says that one of the logical reasons is because that they actually, the first fruits that Adam borrowed when he was in the garden was the grapes. And grapes didn't grow on vines, but they grew on trees at that point in time. And so that's where they came with that conclusion. But whether it's right or wrong, the idea was he, he developed this, for what a better term, he developed this vineyard. We know that what happened after that was the fact he left the boat in righteousness, but he fell. By falling, I mean he became drunk. Now, in his stupor, something happened in which when he's all said and done, he curses his nephew or his, you know, no, his grandson, grandson, right? He curses his grandson, Canaan. The, the idea then is, is the fact that uh, as we lower ourselves, we, we find ourselves dropping and we lose c contact with God. From the very beginning, this is beyond where I was going, but anyway, from the very beginning, God was always in the Garden of Eden with them. But with each and every major mistake that was made, God separated himself out. And it began with Abraham that God began to come back to this world through Abraham's work, through Isaac's work, through Jacob's work, through Joseph's work, through Amram's work, through the ideas of, of uh, Moshe and the ideas of Aaron. They began to come back in Ezekiel we find that the, the spirit of God left again. He departed across the Kidron Valley and onto the Mount of Olives and left again because of the fact that corruption had now taken him further away. So instead of separating ourselves, we began to join together with the world that we were living in. That was the idea that's happening. So as, as we're going along, <clears throat> God inhabits the praises of his people even more than a preoccupation with, with the building. There's also the story of, of, a, of a man who studied Torah for 50 years. He was an old man. He ate one meal a day. The meal was water and bread. The rest of the time he spent in the, in the shul in, in studying. And in this process of studying, he, he lived. Well, the Bel Shem Tov came through his town back in the Carpathian Mountains, back in Russia. He came through their town and he was talking to all the people because one of the things that he wanted to hear was how the people were doing. Now, by that, we normally think of, I'm doing fine. What he was listening for is how they praised God in all things. That was what his listening was. And in those days, he said that the, the Jewish people, population was very understanding of God. But this old man 
was in the shul and he came in there and he saw him and he, he walked over to him and he says, Lord bless you. How are you? And the man didn't look up. And he asked him again and the man didn't look up. Well, the next time he looked like Joe, he looked up, and he saw he was not dressed well. And so at that point in time, he put his head back down and he started studying again. Well, when it was all said and done, he says, why are you still here bothering me? Why don't you go find somebody else to talk to? And he says, in all of your studies, have you not learned Kedoshim? Have you not learned holiness? In our study of holiness here, one of the greatest commandments in the Bible is love your neighbor as yourself in our Christian understanding. What does that look like? How do you portray that? How do you see what that would look like? According to the, to the rabbis, when it was all said and done, the old man had studied for 50 years, but he was no more Torah smart than he would have been had he not taken the time to practice it. For 50 years, he studied from morning till night never practicing it, just trying to soak in the words, understanding. 19, 20, and 21 are about our, our dealing with the world. How should we do with it? We saw in Exodus, we saw the understanding of what the Ten Commandments were. That's Sinai. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy, we will see the Ten Commandments again. But if you look at our story here in Kedoshim, all 10 commandments are there. In other words, this is the sandwich in between. This is where you take all of the things that, that God talked about, and now you put them into practical form. This is what's happening. So in Kedoshim, when you're supposed to be holy, the idea is you're separating yourself unto God. And then you have to define what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, if you have no other instructions, you have the instructions of these three chapters. There are basically 30 commandments in here. Now, according to B'nai Noach, we have seven commandments that we're supposed to learn. Well, my understanding is that the seven are the whittled down version, that originally we were supposed to learn 38. But being Gentiles, we oftentimes didn't have enough mental capacity to hold on to that. And so God gave us seven, easily found in the first seven chapters of the Bible, nine chapters of the Bible. But when we come back to Kedoshim, we're going to find ourselves with problematic texts that should apply to us just as they apply to Jews. If you go over back to the beginning, chapter 19, if I can read you a couple more verses. Back to the first verse. It says, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, speak to the entire assembly of the children of Israel and say to them, I want to make a, an additional comment. There were more than the children of Israel at this conversation. You see, one of the things that this is a Jewish Bible, so it was written to the Jews. So technically, we're reading their mail, except for the fact that we know that there were Gentiles that came out with the Jews. Now, some will tell you that all of them converted by this time, and so that's why they're this way. But I'm not sure that's true because of the next thing that I'm going to read. Now, it goes on to say, you shall be holy for I am holy. Hashem, your God. But I want you to look at the third verse, the first word. Every man. Now, the word for man has multiple ways of being written, expressed. The most uh, exalted way is to use the word ha'adam. Ha'adam, the Adam. In other words, we go back to the perfection of the garden. But that's not how he talks. He uses the word ish for man. The second level. When we look at our, when we're looking at this text, the second level is inclusive. 
it's not directed towards a Jew. It's directed towards man, all of us. And so when I, not to spend all night talking to you or teaching you, my, my understanding, my questions and my thoughts are, we find ourselves at a point where if nothing else, we learn to separate ourselves from the world, not leave the world, but to identify ourselves with a group of people, an organization, if you will, that are built upon the concept of one true God. That's what this whole thing is about, one true God. Now, we call him by different names. In Christianity, he was only known as God. To me, he's been known as the Ein Sof, the incomprehensible one, the, the uh, all nothingness. It's nothing that we can ever describe. But that's who he is. And so as we're looking at, at the text of this three chapters, understand that, yes, there's the, the surface level, but understand beneath that level, it's talking about our soul and how we as Chris, Christians, I'm using the wrong word again, how we as believers look at the world and how we are to grow grow towards separation, but not separation from each other. Separation from the values of immorality. Put yourself in a position where you're doing that which is holy. <clears throat> That's as close as I get to Musar. I, I don't go through the smallest parts. I'm looking for the picture underneath it. That's, that's why I'm spending time talking to you this way. But anyway, <laughs> Ross, is that good enough? I, I took 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay. I'll, 